good afternoon and i think we are already running pretty late we are almost an uh, hour and a half late so i've just made the slides a bit lesser because i think we've already uh, been sitting through this session a lot so my talk is to talk about a new molecule that is the arni uh, also being branded as vimada and its role in cardiac uh, remodeling i think we are all aware that heart failure is a major problem for all our patients and heart failure is one of the commonest cause of uh, hospitalizations and i think what happens is that most of these patients not only do they get admitted but the only other problem is that they tend to get readmitted so almost 44% of all our heart failure patients tend to keep coming back with heart failure within the first year itself after discharge and this is not just the data which is global uh, this is a data which is also local so when we had the indian heart failure and we had the trivandrum heart failure registry this also had a similar data which was similar to the rest of the world where we saw that there is a similarity between all genders so whether it's the men or the women each of them is equally affected with heart failure and as i said the readmission rates are pretty high anywhere between 25 to 30% of patients get readmitted within a year of their first episode of heart failure and this again is something which is pretty distressing for many of our patients where economics also is an important factor and as i said it's just not the economical factor it also means that patients who get readmitted also have a higher mortality so if your patient keeps coming back to the hospital for three admissions with heart failure we also have to understand that his overall mortality is also much greater and this was a problem that we had to always tackle despite the medications that we are using and as dr dipankar already talked about it the beta blockers the ace inhibitors the mras these still had a mortality benefit but over and over that we also had this new novel molecule known as the arni which had blocking effects on the ras inhibition as well as blocking the neprilysin and this was the trial which showed the the uh, paradigm heart failure trial which showed that as compared to enaripril uh, arni had a much greater benefit and this was a great effect i mean we are talking about a 20% risk reduction of overall mortality not many trials have been powered to have such a great mortality benefit and this is one of such great trial which showed a superiority of arni over an enalapril itself in heart failure and based on this trial we had the recommendations on the acc aha guidelines which put it as a class 1 indication where in patients where you still had heart failure despite being on ace inhibitors you could switch them over from ace inhibitors to an arni to get an additional benefit and this was the strength of this uh, data of the paradigm heart failure trial so we started looking at why exactly did these patients did so well and the major reason was that we have to understand that why does this patients go into heart failure why do, what happens to a heart in these patients and the basic thing that happens is that i think we all understand is the inappropriate remodeling and this is something that we had learned way back in our physiology days also and there's something known as remodeling that happens and this involves changes in the cardiac structure there is a myocyte death there is myocyte deformation and all of this leads to a dilatation of the heart there is an eccentric hypertrophy and an increase in the left ventricular end systolic and the end diastolic volumes most of the of the treatment protocols have gone towards what we call as reverse remodeling so whatever changes have happened in the heart muscles we want to get it back to a normal size we want to get it back to a normal shape and that is where these researchers have gone to try and reverse the models to get make sure that these patients have lesser heart failures so as i said earlier in patients who have a heart failure with a reduced ejection fraction again a sign of warning we are not talking about heart failure with a preserved ejection fraction we are talking about heart failure with a reduced ejection fraction and in these patients because of the volume overload there is a dilatation of the heart and over a period of time with chamber enlargement and eccentric hypertrophy there is a volume overload and this is condition of volume overload causes a thinning of the ventricular muscle it also causes a reduction in the systolic function and over a period of time a reduction in the lv uh, increase in the lv volume also so the therapeutic strategies for heart failure reduced ejection fraction was basically to try and correct these pathophysiological changes so what we had to do is to try and correct the hypertrophy we had to make sure that we could get rid of the apoptosis and the necrosis and again as i said try and achieve a reverse remodeling to get back to a normal heart again we had again this is a busy slide and this talks about the different drugs that have been used earlier we had the renin angiotensin aldosterone mechanism we had beta blockers to block the sympathetic nervous system and this is the novel molecule the vimeda or the arni that we are talking about which has additional benefits not only on the uh, ras inhibition but also on neprilysin uh, inhibition and this is the relationship between what is the relationship between cardiac remodeling and prognosis and we had studies to say 
that one, the, one, the, one of the most important indicators of your survival benefits is your ejection fraction. We have enough data over a period of time in many studies to show that the lower the ejection fraction, greater is your mortality. So if you had an ejection fraction that was more than 45%, the chances of your survival is much greater as compared to a patient who has an ejection fraction less than 35%, both in terms of heart failure hospitalization as well as in terms of arrhythmic deaths relating to sudden cardiac death. It also is based on the shape and shape, uh, this function of the valve. The mitral valve, we know, is a dynamic structure. When there's a dilatation of the chamber, the mitral valve apparatus also gets stretched and there is mitral regurgitation that sets in. A mitral regurgitation, again, causes a further aggravation of your uh, left ventricular function by causing, again, a volume overload of the left ventricle and causing an ineffectual contraction of the ventricle. And we have enough data to say that not only the systolic, but the LV diastolic function also gets compromised in a patient with LV dysfunction. And these are the various remodeling patterns, and each of them, these studies over a period of time have shown that patients who have remodeled hearts, so if you have an LV modeling that has already happened, or your LV has already got remodeled, both in terms of hypertrophy or uh, dilatation, there is a greater chance of having both not only cardiovascular death, but also strokes and heart failures. And uh, the studies are mostly targeted to show that if you could correct this, for example, if your ejection fraction improved, you could see that your mortality suddenly drops down. So for an ejection fraction that was less than 35%, as I said, your mortality is much greater. As your ejection fraction improves, your sudden cardiac death mortality would also tend to come down. As your heart pumping becomes better, your size of the heart or the volume, left end diastolic, left ventricle end diastolic volume increases there also causes an increased risk of death. So as your LV function reduces, the diastolic component of the heart or the filling of the ventricle would be much greater and all of this would contribute to a worsening of your outcomes. And the same goes with your left ventricular and systolic volume also. If your heart is not pumping adequately, at the end of your systole, there would be a great amount of volume that is left behind in the ventricle. And if your baseline and systolic volume is high, your chances of mortality also tend to go greater. And this is a study where we looked at the impact of uh, uh, the, or the prognosis of heart failure along with left ventricular end diastolic volume and end systolic volume. And what was shown is that even if you could improve the, if there's an increase in the left ventricular end diastolic volume or end systolic volume by even a, a small amount, even a 10 ml increase in your systolic volumes could increase your risk of death or heart failure hospitalization from anywhere between 9 to 15 percent. So in effect, it may look a very small matter, but all of this or a cardiac remodeling also has a greater effect on cardiac mortality. And this is where uh, the results of uh, the, the CHARM trial was also looked at. And uh, here, uh, this was basically with candesartan, which is another ARB. And what was shown is that once your ejection fraction reduced, there was a greater chance of heart failure hospitalization and cardiovascular death as compared to patients who had an ejection fraction that was much uh, better. Again, the same thing which talks about the left ventricular end systolic volume. And we had devices such as the cardiac resynchronization therapy device. And what it does is that we synchronize the heart so that we pace both the left and the right side of the heart. And we use the heart synchronously so that we can imp improve the effective cardiac output. And in this group of patients where the CRT group was looked at, what was found is that as your left ventricular end systolic volume was reduced by even 10 millimeter, 10%, it was it translated as an improvement in mortality also. So with a cardiac resynchronization therapy, if you could remodel your heart so that you could reduce the end, left ventricular end systolic volume, a small amount of reduction in end systolic volume translated into a greater benefit in terms of reduction of cardiac mortality also. And the same thing which happens with left ventricular end diastolic volume also. So like the systolic volume, even a reduction in end diastolic volume will also translate into a improvement in your uh, ejection fraction and uh, translate into greater cardiac benefits. A reverse remodeling with Weimada has been shown in the heart failure reduced ejection fraction studies. And uh, the basic mechanism, well, this is a very busy slide, but this, this talks about the various uh, proteins where the two drugs work on. And this basically helps to reduce or to cause a ca reverse cardiac remodeling. So Weimada basically does what it does. It acts by reducing the cell death and also prevents the eccentric hypertrophy. And all of this basically translates into a better cardiac remodeling. And we have data from clinical trials which have talked about the use of this drug with Weimada. And benefits have been seen as early as within the first year itself. So within 3 to 12 months of use of this drug, 
we have seen that there has been a reduction in uh, the mitral valve regurgitation status. There has been an improvement in the mitral valve flow patterns and an increase in the ejection fraction with a reduction in the end diastolic and the end systolic volumes. Uh, again, this is also important to see that the ejection fraction does not grow up. You don't need a very dramatic increase in the ejection fraction. So it does not go up from, say, 20% to 60%. But a small amount of improvement in the ejection fraction also will benefit these patients. And this benefits both in terms of heart failure hospitalizations as well as in terms of a sudden cardiac death. So if you had to use this uh, drug in, say, 10 patients, at least seven of these patients would improve in terms of an ejection fraction. And this was uh, uh, seen in, uh, the Paragon, in the Paradigm HF trial also. Uh, again, it is important to see that we are not talking only of idiopathic dilated cardiomyopathy. We are also talking about ischemic, dilated, ischemic cardiomyopathies. And in these trials, as many as 80% of these patients were patients who had had a previous angioplasty or a previous bypass surgery, and they were on this novel molecule. So improvement in uh, Vimeda is both for ischemic L subsets as well as patients who have an LV dysfunction relating from an idiopathic dilated cardiomyopathy. And again, as I said, this improvement happens uh, within a period anywhere between 3 months to 12 months of use. Of course, the data is to continue this even beyond the 12 months also. But amongst these trials, when these patients were added onto Vimeda, despite being on optimal medical therapy. When I'm saying optimal medical therapy, which means that these patients were already on beta blockers, they were already on MRAs, and they were on uh, the other uh, anti-arrhythmics also. And as I said again, what it does is that it reduces the left ventricular end diastolic volume, as well as uh, reduces the end uh, systolic volume significantly when you compare them over, uh, over the baseline without the use of, uh, of uh, Vimeda as compared to enaropril. Uh, so basically, what, to, subs to, uh, to look at this, what happens is that not only does the Vimeda reduce the remod remodeling, there's also a reduction in the mitral flow inflow patterns. So this is also important because many, many of the echocardiographic follow-ups that we do, we look at the mitral flow inflow patterns to look at how your, uh, your uh, remodeling is happening. And there is a significant reduction when the use of Vimeda is used in this group of patients. And again, this, dose, this benefit is dose dependent. So the guidelines talk about using 200 milligrams twice a day, and that's the optimal doses that we want to reach. Of course, we do start with a smaller dose in this group of patients. We do start with 50 milligrams twice a day, and then build up based on their hemodynamic uh, response and their creatinine response to reach, try and reach 200 milligrams twice a day. And as I said earlier, uh, the increase in the ejection fraction happens pretty early in, in the course of the disease. And within a period of three months in this trial, we could see that there is a significant improvement in the uh, dosage of, in the uh, ejection fraction. Uh, so I think what we need to understand is that there are larger trials going on which are looking at uh, the use of uh, Vimeda in ventricular remodeling or on large vessels also. And two such trials, what I would like to mention is one is the Evaluate HF trial. Whereas compared to ACE inhibitors or enaropril, Vimeda has been compared in a one is to one fashion in a double blinded trial to look at the aortic stiffness. So this is one of the indirect methods to look at the ventricular remodeling to see how much is the resistance. And uh, this trial is going to look at a randomization over a period of uh, almost uh, two years. And uh, as I said, this is a, a double blinded trial where the first runoff within the first 12 weeks is double blinded with Vimeda and enaropril. And after the 12 weeks period, it's going to be an open label trial where these patients are going to be on, uh, in April, uh, on Vimeda alone. And the other trial that we are talking about is the PROVE HF trial. And this trial is also going to look at the NT PRO BNP, which is one of the markers of heart failure. And it's also going to look at cardiac remodeling modeling, re assessed by echocardiography. And all these parameters that we talked about, end systolic, end diastolic volume, left atrial volume index, mitral inflow patterns, to see how much is the baseline as compared to a one year follow up. And these two trials are basically, uh, we are still awaiting the results of these trials. And these will give us an idea about how the, uh, uh, the remodeling happens with Vimeda as compared to the other optimal medical group that we have. So to summarize, we know that heart failure is a major uh, disease for us. Patients have a problem of coming back with re-hospitalizations. And we know that these re-hospitalizations have a mortality uh, effect also. Uh, we now have a new novel molecule, which is the ARNI or the angiotensin receptor neutralizing inhibitor, Vimeda, which can improve remodeling in these patients with heart failure. And not only on those patients who are not been on, be on these medications earlier, but also a switch can be made from ACE inhibitors or ARBs 
to those to RNA for those patients who have been on optimal medical therapy previously. Thank you for your um, patient hearing. Thank you, Dr. Khan. Yeah. Now this session is open for questions. Is there any question? I have one question, please. <coughs> yes. Long-standing diabetic patient having CKD, a creatinine clearance uh, about 45 to 50, had this dilated cardiomyopathy. It has been detected now. Now, what should be the ideal treatment for this patient? Right. So I think uh, what we, uh, this is a very good question. The first thing is that we need to identify and try and identify correctable causes for the LV dysfunction. And we know that as uh, the Pankar also talked about, there are many causes which can produce LV dysfunction and ischemia being one of the, the commonest cause. So in these patients, we need to evaluate and find out whether the patient has an ischemic component, whether there's an ep episode of reversible coronary artery disease, whether there is angina or reversible ischemia that we can tackle. And this could be by means of a treadmill or for patients who are not very active by means of other imaging modalities, a dobutamine stress echo or a stress thallium or any other methods to find out whether there's reversible ischemia. Now, as you said, the patient already has a kidney disease. So therefore, the decision in terms of making a decision in terms of further invasive management, say an angiography or a further bypass surgery or an angioplasty, will be based on the area of risk. So if the patient has a large area of myocardium at risk where not treating the ischemia is going to produce LV dysfunction, then I think it may be worthwhile taking a risk and going ahead with an angiography. But if there's a small amount of area at risk, then probably optimal medical management with anti-anginals may be good enough for this patient. The second thing also is correction of correctable factors, as I said, like of hypertension, or many other correctable factors. Diabetes per se itself, you need to correct diabetes well to get a good amount of uh, uh, LV function improvement. And uh, as uh, Dipankar also presented, we have data with the SGL2 inhibitors, the DAPA HF, which also have shown benefits. Now amongst the molecules that we're talking about, RNA that we talked about just now, the guidelines are to not to use it beyond less than 30 uh, ml uh, creatinine clearance. So one has to be careful once using RNA in this group of patients, and one must repeat a creatinine clearance even in the borderline group to say that we are not ending up with hyperkalemia or a worsening of the creatinine factors. So beta blockers can probably be used safely. We can use the other medical pump that we used to talk about, uh, aprosol with a nitrate with a nitrate inhibit with a nitro, uh, with a oral nitrate. So preload and postload both can be reduced with nitrates and and uh, uh, with aprosol. So these are good drugs with hydrolysin. So that these are good drugs to use in this group of patients. And of course, judicious use of diuretics also. So one has to be again balancing risk of causing symptom benefit with increasing the creatinine uh, and worsening the creatinine clearance by increasing too much of aggressive diuresis in this group of patients also. So again, I think there are a lot of correctable factors that we need to first identify. And again, as I said, try the best optimal medical therapy, both in terms of uh, the beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, preload and afterload reduction. And if at all, the borderline more than 30, we could try RNA still in this group of patients. Sir.